Hey there, back again for part two of sequences. Uh, let's go ahead and look at example five here. It says, for what values of r is r to the nth convergent? Now, if we were to look at, uh, let's call this sequence a sub n, which is r to the nth, that would be r to the first, r to the second, r to the third, continuing on as n is greater than or equal to one. Now, if you consider a number greater than 1 for r, number greater than 1 for r will make a sub n divergent. Okay, as if you took 2 to the first, 2 to the second, 2 to the third, etc. The limit as n approaches infinity of a to the n, if r is greater than 1, would be divergent. Okay, also consider that the same would be true if r is less than negative 1. Then a sub n would also be div divergent. Apparently I s chose to spell it all the way out. I'll do that for both, I guess. So the question becomes then, well, a couple of things. If r is between negative 1 and 1, all right, so values like negative 8 ninths or positive 1 third. Uh, if this is the case, then a sub n will be convergent. Okay, however, what would happen if r equaled negative 1? or if r equaled positive 1. Well, let's look at those two sequences specifically. So if r equaled negative 1, then our terms would be negative 1 to the first, which is negative 1, negative 1 to the second, which is positive 1, negative 1 to the third, and so on. Now, this will be divergent. If r is negative 1, a sub n will be divergent. All right, you can see if I were to look at the sequence on a graph, uh, first term is negative one, second term positive one, third term negative one, fourth term positive one. We're never actually converging on or to a value. Therefore, if r equals negative one, a sub n is divergent. If r equals positive one, we would get one to the first, one to the second, one to the third, one to the fourth, Etc. So clearly we can see that if r equals 1, a sub n will be convergent. Okay, so our conclusion is that if we have a geometric sequence, this is geometric, okay, if we have a geometric sequence, r to the nth power is convergent if r is less than or equal to 1 or greater than negative 1. And r to the nth is divergent for all other values for r outside of that interval. So whatever, I'm just going to say all other values. Okay, so if r to the nth is convergent, then what we'll notice is that, and we didn't really speak about this, but if r is between negative 1, oops, let me use a proper notation here, negative 1 and 1, then the limit of that sequence will actually be 0. So you could take, for example, r equals 1 half, and this would be true for all values between negative 1 and 1. So a sub n would be 1 half, 1 half squared, 1 half cubed, 1 half to the fourth, etc. You can see that clearly the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n would equal 0. Okay, so our limit as n approaches infinity of r to the nth equals 0 if r is between negative 1 and 1. If r equals 1, then this limit equals 1. Okay, now you could look at that uh, with negative values for r. All you'll see is an alternating sequence which will approach 0 as n approaches infinity. All right, so let's talk a little bit about increasing, decreasing sequences and an idea called monotonic sequences. So a sequence a sub n is increasing if its nth term is less than its 
n plus 1th term for all n greater than or equal to 1, meaning that the next term is always greater than the previous term, and decreasing if the previous term is greater than the next term. Right? That would make sense. Monotonic means always increasing or always decreasing. And how would we know this? Well, there's a couple ways to do that. There's an algebraic way using you know, the n plus 1th term minus the nth term, showing that you know, it's either greater than zero, which would mean increasing, or less than zero, which would mean decreasing. Or we could use a first derivative, uh, which if it's positive, will tell us that the function is monotonic increasing. And if it's negative, it would mean it's monotonic decreasing. So in example six, it says the following sequence, increasing or decreasing. Now, what you want to do is you want to first of all define this as a function. So I'm going to define f of n as 3 over n plus 5. And I can do that because this function f of n is continuous on the interval from 1 to infinity, right? Since, since n is greater than or equal to 1, I want this to be continuous for all values greater than or equal to 1. Okay, I could see clearly if I were to look at this function that there would be a discontinuity at negative 5, but since our terms are all positive, we don't really care. Okay, so now we've defined it as a function. So let's find f prime of n. So if f of n is 3 over n plus 5, I could actually write that. I'm going to use a power rule. That would be 3 times n plus 5 to the negative first. You could use the quotient rule as well. Totally up to you how you do that. Okay, I'm just going to use the power rule, which would make this negative 3 over n plus 5 squared. Okay, so I can look at this, and clearly, since n is greater than or equal to 1, then f prime of n will be less than 0 for all n greater than or equal to 1. Okay, so if, if f prime of n is going to be less than 0 for all n greater than or equal to 1, then I know f of n is strictly decreasing. Okay, so I haven't answered my question yet. Now what I'm going to say is then that therefore 3 over n plus 5, this sequence, will be monotonic decreasing. All right, outstanding. So I defined my sequence as a function, showed it was continuous on the domain, found the derivative, determined that the derivative would be less than zero on that domain. Therefore, I knew the function would be strictly decreasing. Thus, the sequence would be monotonic decreasing. All right, let's continue with another example. All right, example seven, very similar, uh, wants us to show that a sub n is decreasing. Okay, so I'm going to rewrite a sub n as a function, f of n, as n over n squared plus 1. Uh, that function is defined for all real numbers. Uh, there are no uh, gaps in its domain. Therefore, f of n is continuous on the interval from 1 to infinity. And with sequences, we always start with n equals 1. Uh, in some sequences, we'll start with n equals 0, but for now, we're all at n equals 1 and greater. Okay, so now I'm going to have to likely use the quotient rule. So I'm going to find the derivative. That will be the low function, or the denominator, times the derivative of the high, which is the derivative of n, minus the high function times the derivative of the low, which would be 2n all over the low function squared. All right, so I'm going to clean this up. It's not all that easy to see right now. But I would have n squared plus 1 minus 2n squared. n squared plus 1, let's rewrite this, n squared plus 1 minus 2n squared. All right, well, that would be negative n squared plus 1 
over n squared plus 1 squared. Okay, so when we analyze this, um, f prime of n would equal 0 at n equals 1. However, if n is greater than 1, f prime of n will be less than 0. Okay, so I can't say it's monotonic decreasing, it being the function. But I can say that f of n is decreasing when n is greater than 1. Okay, therefore, a sub n, which is equal to n over n squared plus 1, is decreasing. All right, outstanding. Let's talk about another topic called boundedness. All right, so by definition, a sequence is bounded if there is a number, capital M, such that all terms, a sub n, are less than or equal to that number when n is greater than or equal to 1. The sequence is bounded below if there is a value lowercase m such that that value is less than or equal to all terms when n is greater than or equal to 1. If it is bounded above and below, a sub n is considered a bounded sequence. Okay, so if you look at an example, let's say a sub n equals n, what would that look like? Well, the first term would be 1, the second term would be 2, the third term would be 3, the fourth term would be 4, and so on. Now, as you think of that sequence, that is bounded below by 0, but it's not bounded above. Okay, so that is bounded below, but it will continue in that pattern in a linear nature headed toward... Uh, an uncountable value. Okay, if you look at part B, a sub n equals n over n plus 1. Okay, so n over n plus 1 would be 1 over 2, then 2 over 3, then 3 over 4, then 4 over 5, then 5 over 6. That is going to be approaching... That will be approaching y equals 1. Therefore, that sequence would be bounded above by 1 and below by 0. Thus, it is a bounded sequence. The first example, example A, is not bounded, above at least. It is bounded below. Now, this statement right here is very important. Not every bounded sequence is convergent. For example, negative 1 to the nth. Let's check out negative 1 to the nth. Looks like this. All right, we got negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, positive 1, negative 1, continuing on. It's bounded. It's got an upper bound of 1. It's got a lower bound of negative 1. However, it never converges. All right? And not every monotonic sequence converges. So, for example, example A up here, this is monotonic. It's always increasing, monotonic increasing, but it doesn't converge. However, very important, every bounded monotonic sequence will converge. So if a sequence is bounded and it's monotonic, it will converge. The example that I'd like to highlight is this one here, a sub n in part b. It's monotonic because it's always increasing and it's bounded on both the bottom and the top, or it's got an upper bound and lower bound, therefore it has to converge. Okay, let's look at a few practice problems and determine whether the following sequences converge or diverge. And I'm just going to employ some of the, the ideas that we've talked about during this lesson. Okay, so number one. Number one, first of all, I would rewrite personally as a geometric sequence. E over 3 to the nth power. So you get E over 3. You get E squared over 9. You get E cubed over 27, etc. This is a geometric sequence because each time you multiply by E over 3. Now we know that if r is greater than, excuse me, less than or equal to 1, greater than negative 1, that we have a convergent sequence. Okay, so in this case, 
r is equal to e over 3. And it just so happens that e over 3 is less than 1 and greater than negative 1. Therefore, uh, the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n will equal 0. Thus, a sub n is convergent. Okay, let's look at number 5. Okay, sometimes it's nice to write out terms, and you definitely can. Okay, in this case, if I were to write out a few terms, uh, that would be negative 1 plus 1 over negative 1 minus 1. There's our first term. And then, ne excuse me, positive 1. That would be negative 1 squared. Positive 1 uh, plus 2 over positive 1 minus 2. And then negative 1 plus 3 over negative 1 minus 3. All right, so let's see if there's any pattern here. Uh, the first term would be 0. The second term would be negative 3. The third term will be, uh, looks like, negative 1 half. Okay, so I'm not really seeing a pattern. So what I would do in this case is you could continue to write out terms, and that's fine. But sometimes a better option is to consider where would the sequence head towards uh, as n goes to infinity. So this term here becomes relatively insignificant. And so does this term here. So as n becomes very large, Okay, a sub n starts to behave similarly to b sub n. I'm going to rewrite b sub n as n over negative n. So what is the limit as n approaches infinity of b sub n? Well, that would be negative 1. Therefore, the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n would also equal negative 1. Thus a sub n is convergent. Cool. All right, let's look at number two. I skipped to five. Don't know why. So let's get into number two. Let's write out a few terms. Let's see what this thing looks like visually. Uh, so a sub n would be uh, negative one to the first square root of one. Okay, so that'd be negative one. Then we'd have positive one square root of two. Okay, this is square root of two. Then negative 1 square root of 3. Then positive 1 square root of 4. Then negative 1 square root of 5. Now, if you were to look at the absolute value of a sub n, you would notice the following. Notice that each of the terms is increasing all right, without bound. All right, so the square root does not have an upper bound. So if I were to graph the two of them, I'll do one of them in different colors here. Um, let's do a sub n in red, and we'll do absolute value in blue. All right, so a sub n in red would be, well, negative 1 square root of 2. It's negative square root of 3, 2. Negative square root of 5 and then whatever would come next. Now what you'll see here is if we did the absolute value, we would just get each of the points repeated. So each of these negative values, um, right, they just get flipped over the n axis. So, and we can tell, right, the square root of n is divergent. It is divergent. Therefore, it's alternating sequence, a sub n, negative 1 to the nth, square root of n, will also be divergent. What that tells us is that the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n doesn't exist. Okay, let's look at number 6. Number 6 has got a, a little trick, a little natural logarithm, or 
properties of logarithms embedded. If you wrote out the terms here, it would get really uh, quite nasty. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to rewrite a sub n in a separate form. I'm going to write it as natural log of e to the fourth, excuse me, four nth over three n. And I'm going to rewrite it again. And what you know in properties of logarithm, logarithms is an exponent inside the argument of the log can be brought out as a coefficient of the logarithm. Okay, and the natural log of e is just 1. Okay, so technically speaking, a sub n is just 4n over 3n. Okay, so this would be monotonic increasing as well as uh, the limit as n approaches infinity of a to the nth, or a sub n, would be 4 thirds. Thus, a sub n is convergent. It would converge to that value. All right, let's look at a few more examples. All right, let's do a few more examples, employing a couple other techniques here. Um, I'm going to look at specifically the absolute value of a sub n here. I'm going to look at its limit as n goes to infinity. So uh, if I took the limit as n approached infinity of 1 over the square root of n, I would clearly see that that would equal 0. Square root of n increases without bound, uh, therefore that would be true. Thus, uh, absolute value of a sub n is convergent. And in one of our theorems in this lesson, we could then therefore say that a sub n is also convergent. Okay, very good. So when you have an alternating series, or excuse me, sequence, consider the non-alternating sequence in order to determine convergence. Okay, so it looks like number, uh, number four is also potentially an alternating sequence, however, um, let's just write out a few terms to ensure that that's true. So let's see what that looks like. Well, the first term would be negative 1 to the third power. The second term, negative 1 to the fifth power. The third term, negative 1 to the seventh power. So is this an alternating sequence? The answer to that is no. We actually get negative 1 for all terms. So as we look at sequence convergence, the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is actually equal to negative 1. Thus, a sub n is convergent. Okay, number 7. I see an alternating sequence. Let me drop the alternator Okay, and look at the absolute value of a sub n. What that would be would be the cosine of pi all right, so that'd be 2 times pi over 2. Then we get the cosine of, that would be 3 pi over 2. And then we get the cosine of 4 pi over 2, which is 2 pi. Then we get the cosine, let's write one more term out and just see what happens here. Actually, two more. Uh, so I had first, second, third, fourth, so that'd be 5 pi over 2. And let's go one more. Cosine of uh, 6 pi over 2, which would be 3 pi. Okay, so these terms, this would be a negative 1. And then we would get 0, and then a positive 1, and then 0, and then a negative 1. Okay, so that clearly does not converge. Now, if I were to consider just a sub n, in case you were maybe not sure, all right, let's look at the terms here. So each of the terms would be alternating in sign. So the first term uh, would be the opposite of whatever it is, right? So we'd get negative 1 times cosine of pi. So this would be a positive 1. And then we'd have a uh, positive 1 times 0, which is still 0, and then we'd have a negative 1 times 1, which is negative 1. So it really is just going to flip the signs of the sequence. So 
Both are going to show similar patterns. Clearly, I can see that both A sub n and absolute value of A sub n are going to be uh, divergent. And again, just to reiterate, that means that the limit as n approaches infinity of A sub n doesn't exist. Okay, number eight. Let's look at this. I could drop the alternator. Um, I don't really care. I could take that technique. I could just include the alternator. Let's see what it works out to be with the alternator. So that would be negative one to the first times sine of three pi over two. Okay, then I'd have negative one to the second, which is positive one, sine of five pi over two. Then I'd have negative one to the third, which is negative one, sine of seven pi over two. And then negative one to the fourth, which would be positive one, sine of nine pi over two. All right, we can continue that if we wanted. Uh, so let's look at our actual terms. It's kind of hard to tell what they are right now. Sine of 3 pi over 2 is negative 1. So negative 1 times negative 1 is 1. Sine of 5 pi over 2 is 1. So 1 times 1 is 1. Negative 1 times 7 pi, sine of 7 pi over 2 is negative 1 times negative 1, which is 1. And then we see that this continues. So the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is equal to 1. Therefore a sub n is convergent. Okay, so this was really just a fancy way to say that a sub n equals one. That is just, I don't know, that, that's a crazy way to write a sub n equals one. But hey, it's testing your knowledge of sequences. All right, let's do a few more problems and we'll call it a day. All right, let's look at 13. Now 13, I could write out all terms, right? Uh, if I wanted to. Um, and it would be 1 minus point 0.1, 1, 1 minus point, or excuse me, 1 minus point 0.2, 1 minus point 0.2 squared, 1 minus point 0.2 cubed, etc. on down the line. So you can see what's happening to this term as n gets really big. That term goes to zero. So the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n actually equals 1, right? That second term as n gets really big, uh, it's geometric, therefore it's going to head to zero. Now, formally, what I would probably do is I'd take the limit as n approaches infinity of 1, and I'd subtract the limit as n approaches infinity of 0.2 to the nth. Right? This limit here is just going to be 1. And this limit here, based on the geometric sequence properties that we talked about earlier, since 0.2 is between 1 and negative 1, I know that that'll go to 0. Therefore, our limit will equal 1. Thus, a sub n is convergent. Okay, let's look at another. Uh, let's go down to 17 here. Okay, so instead of writing out all terms, like tangent of 2 pi over 9, tangent of 4 pi over 17, etc., what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually take the tangent of the limit as n approaches infinity, 2n pi over 1 plus 8n. All right, so this limit, all right, this limit would end up equaling, if you look at uh, this rational expression, 2 pi over 2n pi over 1 plus 8n, as n goes to infinity, will actually head toward. Uh, that'll head toward 2 pi over 8. Now that's cool. 2 pi over 8 is the same as pi over 4. Therefore, the limit of this sequence would be 1. So the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n, I'm not writing that whole thing out as 1, therefore a sub n converges. Awesome. Okay, let's look at another couple here. Ooh, that's moving on me. Okay, uh, I'll do one more on this page, I suppose. Let's do number 18 right next to it. 
Okay, so one of our properties of limits, uh, for example, right, you could use L'Hopital's rule. You're going to get something funky here, but if I were to plug in an infinity, just direct substitution, I would get the square root of infinity over infinity, right? And that's not something you want to say that it equals. You just want to kind of note that mentally. Now, one of our techniques for dealing with indeterminate form like this is to take all terms, right? all terms, divide them by the highest powered term in the denominator. All right, what do I mean by that? This is what I mean by that. I'm going to take n over n, 1 over n, 9n over n, and 1 over n. So let's discuss what that would look like as n goes to infinity. That would be a limit. n goes to infinity, square root, 1 plus 1 over n, over 9 plus 1 over n. Well, what would 1 over n head toward as n goes to infinity? It'd go to 0. So this would be the square root of 1 plus 0 over 9 plus 0, which is equivalent to the square root of 1 ninth one ninth, which is equivalent to one third. Therefore, the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is equal to one third, and thus a sub n converges. Let's look at a couple more examples. All right, let's look at uh, 22 to start with. So the limit as n approaches infinity of cosine of 2 over n. What will that go to? Well, the this would go to or head toward cosine of the limit of 2 over n as n goes to infinity. Well, what would that equal? That would equal the cosine of, and this limit right here is equal to 0. All right, so what does that go to? It goes to 1. So the limit as, a, as n approaches infinity of a sub n equals 1. Therefore, it's convergent. Okay, 24. This one's kind of cool. I like 24. I actually like to look at this one graphically. All right, so here's pi over 2. Here's negative pi over 2. Uh, arctangent. And I don't really even care about the, the uh, 2 over n on the inside. That just means that our value is going to get larger quicker. Our, our angle is going to get larger quicker. Excuse me, our ratio. Um, but I know that there's uh, horizontal asymptotes on arctangent at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So the graph of arctangent actually looks like this. So as n gets really, really big, right, as n increases in value headed this way, look at that, our function arctangent of 2n just approaches pi over 2. So the limit as n approaches infinity of the arctangent of 2n equals pi over 2. Sequence is convergent. Very cool. Uh, 27, one just to be aware of. Uh, in 27, this is actually a very special limit. Uh, the limit as n approaches infinity of uh, 1 plus 1 over n to the nth is equal to e to the first. Therefore, the limit as n approaches infinity of 1 plus 2 over n to the nth is actually e squared. So that limit does exist. Um, and the sequence is convergent to e squared. Uh, the last one I want to cover on this page is 28. Now, before I move on to 28, actually, there's a lot going on here. And you have to use... Uh, indeterminate form for limits, L'Hopital's rule, some crazy stuff. If you do want to cover that on the side, I can help you. Okay, 28. So let's look at this limit as n approaches infinity of said function, or excuse me, said sequence in a different way. Let's look at it as uh, 2 to the 1 plus 3 nth to the 1 over nth power. All right, so... The nth root is the same as the 1 over nth power. Well, using uh, properties of exponents, this is going to be equivalent to 2 to the 1 over nth plus 
3, because 3n times 1 over nth is 3. Now I'm going to use a property of um, exponentials to rewrite this. As the limit as n goes to infinity of 2 to the 1 over nth times 2 to the third, right? Because we know that uh, x to the a plus b is equivalent to x to the a times x to the b. Okay, cool. So this is actually equivalent to 8 times the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 to the 1 over nth. Okay, 2 to the third I brought out as an 8. I'm going to skip this stuff here, just kind of clean that up a little bit. This will be 8 times the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 to the 1 over nth. Well, 1 over n goes to 0, so 2 to the 1 over nth goes to 1. Therefore, this limit is 8. Okay, so the limit, let's clean it up to finish, as n approaches infinity of the nth root of 2 to the 1 plus 3 nth is equal to 8. Thus, the sequence converges. Okay, uh, let's move on to one more example on the next page. All right, number 32. Um, number 32, graphically, eh, not real excited about that. Um, but if you think about this, the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n is going to take on the form infinity over infinity. Okay, so... Now I gotta think about this. Let's think about this using L'Hopital's rule. Since the limit as n approaches infinity of the natural log of n squared is headed toward infinity, and the limit as n approaches infinity of n is headed to infinity, then I can use L'Hopital's rule. L'Hopital's rule allows me, provided that I have defined natural log of n squared and that it's continuous for n greater than or equal to 1, which it is, and I've defined g of n as n, and that's continuous for n greater than or equal to 1, which it is, then I can reevaluate the limit by taking the derivative of the upper function, which would be 2 ln of n times 1 over n over 1. Okay, so this is interesting now because you might be uh, convinced to think that this is 0 or that it's infinity, right? Because the limit as n approaches infinity at 2 ln of n, you, you might see it as 2 times infinity times 0. 1 over n heads to 0. Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually rewrite this limit. This limit is not 0, and it's not infinity. There's still more work to be done. Anytime you use L'Hopital's rule, you have to simplify fully first. So I'm going to rewrite this as the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 ln of n over n. Okay, now it's still in this form, infinity, whoa, that's an 8, infinity over infinity. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to utilize L'Hopital's rule again. So I'm using L'Hopital's rule a second time, which tells me then that this limit would be equivalent to the limit as n approaches infinity of 2 over n over 1. Okay, so the derivative of 2 ln of n is 2 over n, the derivative of n is 1, and this limit ends up heading towards 0. Okay, so that tells us that the limit as n approaches infinity of a sub n equals 0, and therefore our sequence is convergent. Uh, it's very interesting to see that the rate of change as n goes to infinity of ln of n squared is overwhelmed by the linear function n. All right, guys, that's it for Sequences Part 2. Hope it went well. Have a great day.